Okay, the recording is on. This is BC 111, Faith, our second lecture for today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the course notes. All right. Okay. So let's go to chapter two. So we're done with chapter one. Any questions? Chapter one? Okay. I'll go. Oh, what's your name again? Jay Deva. Jay Deva. Okay, welcome. Um, you get the course notes, then he'll give it to you. Then I will give you the course notes. Okay. All right. So let's go to chapter two. On, um, and in chapter two, What we want to do is talk about God's sovereignty, grace, and faith. So God is a sovereign God. That means he's all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants. Nobody can stop him. Hinder him, prevent him. God is sovereign. God is also a God of grace. What is grace? That means He gives us freely what we don't deserve. That's grace. So God is sovereign. God is a God of grace. So if God is sovereign, God is a God of grace. Why does he still want us to have faith? That is the question. And we need to clearly understand this. Because many believers, many Christians, don't understand how these three interact. That means the sovereignty of God, the grace of God, and our faith. They don't understand how these three interact. Because if you think like this, you know, a God is sovereign. He will do whatever he wants and he can do whatever he wants. Who's stopping him? So, okay. If, so we say, if God wants to heal me, he will heal me. If God wants to bless me, he will bless me. So leave it. Because God is sovereign. Jo kuch karna hai. Like you say in Hindi, whatever he wants to do, he will do. Why I should have faith? Or we say, it's the grace of God. God will freely give to us. Why must we have faith? You know, why must we believe God? Why must we you know, uh, read the scriptures and, and, and believe the promises and stand upon the promises? And why must we have faith in God? If he is giving to us by grace. And how do these three interact? That's what we want to answer in this chapter. right? So let's talk about the sovereignty of God, which the Bible presents to us very clearly. Right? Uh, so Jay Deva, we'll get you a copy of the notes. All right? Maybe in the break time. Okay, we'll get we'll, we'll organize that. So um so the Bible is very clear about the sovereignty of God. Right? Example scriptures we can see in Job 42 and verse 2. Uh, Job says, I know that you can do everything. I know you can do everything. And no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. I mean, God, you are sovereign. Who, who can stop you? You can do everything. So if God wants to heal somebody, he can heal. If God wants to bless somebody, he can bless. Whatever God wants, he can do. Nobody can. God is sovereign. Our uh, Psalm 115 verse 3, the psalmist said, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. See, God can do whatever he pleases. He can do. Or in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king at that time, uh, he says, you know, 
uh, all, all the inhabitants of the earth, and he's talking about God, his dominion is an everlasting dominion, his kingdom is from generation to generation. Uh, all the inhabitants of the earth are like nothing. And uh, you know, who can restrain his hand? Who can stop the hand of God? Who can restrain his hand and tell him, what are you doing? Who, nobody can stop God. So the Bible is very clear that God is a sovereign God, powerful. He can do anything. Then we also know that God is a gracious God. That means God is a God of grace. Now, what, what, is, what, what do we mean by grace? Grace means God gives what we don't deserve. That is grace. He's a God of grace. We don't deserve it. We are uh, we have we have sinned. We are we do wrong things. But still, God loves us. Till He blesses us. Till He gives. To God is a God of grace. And His grace is available for everyone. You know. So uh, some scriptures on grace. It says in Psalm eighty-six, verse fifteen, "You were Lord God, full of compassion, gracious." Long suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. So God is full of compassion, full of this, merciful, gracious, patient. And not only that, Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9 says, The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy. The Lord is good to how many people? All. He's good to all. He's not partial. So in his grace, his grace is available for everybody. He's good to all. So uh, I can't say only that person, only that person. No, no, no. The Lord is good to all. Good to everyone. Equal. So God is sovereign, all-powerful. God is gracious, he's loving, he's compassionate, and he's gracious to everybody. He's not partial God. His tender mercies are over all his works. And yet, there is the coming together of grace and sovereignty. That means God is gracious, but he's also sovereign. And what he says is, because I'm sovereign, if I want to do some good to somebody, I'll do it. If he wants to single out somebody, he will still single out, because he's sovereign. His grace is available to everyone. But if he wants to give one extra apple to Nickel, he'll give one extra apple, nobody can question why you gave one extra apple. He said, I'm giving apple to everybody. But I want to give an extra apple to Nickel, I'll give one extra. Or Vimil. Eh? I want to give two oranges to Vimil. I'll give two oranges. He'll give two oranges to Vimil. Why? Because he's sovereign. Uh, then he will do what he wants. He's God. He's gracious. He'll give orange to everyone. But while he's gracious, if he wants to give two more to women, he'll give. Who can question? So in Exodus 33, 19, God says, you know, he's telling Moses, um, uh, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Meaning, see, I am a gracious God. I am a compassionate God. And in my sovereignty, if I want to extend mercy, grace, compassion to somebody in a special way, I'll do it. So even in the expressions of his sovereignty, uh, in the expressions of grace and compassion, he's sovereign. So he's impartial, and yet if he chooses to, he can do something as a sovereign God. And so understanding God is sovereign, God is gracious, and in his sovereignty, he can extend grace and compassion as he chooses. His grace and compassion is available to everyone. But yet, 
in his sovereignty, he can do something special. I understand. So, example. Example. Why did God choose Abraham? He could have chosen somebody in China. He could have chosen somebody in Japan. He could have chosen somebody in South America. He could have chosen somebody somewhere else, Africa. Why did he choose Abraham? And said, come. I will make of you a great nation. It's not like there was lottery in heaven <laughs> and Abraham picked the right. <laughs> it's not like that. So God is good to everyone. But he wanted to fulfill a certain purpose. And so he chose a man. And this man was Abraham. Nobody can question that because God is sovereign. He will do what he wants. So he is good to all. He's not partial. But he chose Abraham as a sovereign God to carry out a particular purpose. That does not make him impartial. It only is an expression of his sovereignty. Because he's still impartial to everybody. He said, I love everybody. But I want to do something. I will, I'm choosing right now for this one. I'm choosing Abraham. Or you think about in John chapter 5, Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda. Hmm? The Bible says there, there were many sick people lying around the pool. We don't know how many, maybe 50, maybe 100. So many sick people are lying around the pool. Jesus comes to one man and asks him, do you want to be well? Do you want to get well? Excuse me, there are 50 people. Everybody wants to get well. <laughs> or I don't know what the number, maybe 100 people. Of course, everybody wants to get well. That's why they are there. But he comes to one man. He says, do you want to be well? This man doesn't know who Jesus is. He's thinking somebody has come. To help him jump, push him in the water. <laughs> so he says, Sir, I'm sitting here, I'm here for a long time. Nobody's able to push me first in the water. You think you'll push me first? <laughs> He's thinking like that. Right? Because, you know, and when an angel went to the water, the first person who got in got healed. He, I'm sure all these years he must have tried going first. He never, he always missed, came second, third, last. I don't know. He never made it first. So he's thinking, oh, who is this man who can put me first? But Jesus tells him, rise, take up your bed, go home. And immediately he's healed by the power of God. And then Jesus says, I only do what I see my father do. This is John chapter 5. What I see my father do, that's what I do. That means the father. God wanted to heal this one man. But what about all the others? Isn't God good to everybody? Well, we just read in the scripture, God is good to all. But yet, in that, He is also sovereign. That means He can sovereignly move and do something special for somebody. If he wants to, he is a sovereign God. Nobody can question. So, grace, sovereignty, and grace. Then, in, in, in that connection, that God is sovereign, God is gracious, where does faith come? Where does faith come? So the wrong posture is, ah, you know, God is sovereign, God is gracious. If he wants, he'll do something good for me. I have to sit and wait. 
if it happens it happens if it doesn't happen i have to go through life in heaven i'll ask why he didn't help me <laughs> what should i do well the bible doesn't say that the bible teaches us about faith so while god is sovereign and god is gracious what he says is this what i offer by grace anybody can receive through faith so what god gives by grace anybody can receive by so that is very important so why is faith important what God gives by grace, anybody can receive by faith. So you don't have to wait for God to sovereignly give you an expression of grace. You don't have to wait. You can receive by faith what he gives to everybody through grace. So that's where faith comes. And for example, salvation is a free gift. It is a gift of grace. It is available for every human being. It is available for every, every person today. Today, if, if there are 8 billion, actually there may be less than 8 billion, but example. If there are 8 billion people living on the planet Earth right now, all 8 billion people can be saved right now if they all have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God is giving salvation as a free gift, by grace, through faith in Jesus. Anyone can receive. Anyone. Right? And yet, at the same time, God will sovereignly appear to somebody. So sometimes you hear these stories. Somebody, you know, the Lord may speak to that person in a dream. Or he may, he or she may have a vision. The Lord may come to that person. Now, why doesn't God come to everybody? Suppose the Lord Jesus came to all 8 billion people today, right now, everybody will say, yes, Jesus is Lord, saved, finished. <laughs> why doesn't he just appear to all 8 billion people? No. Because he's made it available by grace, and he wants us all to come by faith. But because he's sovereign, he will still appear to one or two, or whoever he chooses, in a very personal way, in a very powerful way, in a dream or a vision or something, those people will get saved. So that's God being sovereign. But the same thing he does for them, it's also available for everybody by grace through faith. Are you understanding? The person who may have had a vision and a God saved, his salvation is no different from the salvation of the person who received it by grace through faith. Same. Same salvation. Same. No different. So, what are we saying? We're saying that by faith we receive everything that God gives by grace. Anyone can receive. Anyone can come to God and receive from God what He freely gives by grace. We can receive by Now, if God chooses 
to move sovereignly in your life, to do something, that is okay. That's up to him. We can't dictate that. What we can determine is whether or not we receive what he give, freely gives by grace through faith. Whether we receive or not, we determine that. We don't determine his sovereign move. We determine what he freely gives by grace through faith. Is it clear? So, God, throughout his word, you know, let me just look at this here. That whenever God speaks, or whenever God wants to do something, he declares his word, we believe it, and then that word is fulfilled. So even in your personal life, so like the example in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 to 12, about Abraham, you see, God may give you a personal word and say, I want to do this in your life. But you, by faith, you have to walk with God to see that word fulfilled in your life. So even Abraham, he was called by God, but he still had to walk by faith to see God's work fulfilled in his life. So you mentioned about Abraham. He had to walk by faith. So there is what God gives to everybody by grace through faith. There is the specific working of God in your life. Right? So you're learning in a different course on fulfilling God's purpose. Right? You're learning about how God has a specific plan and a purpose for your life. So for each one of us, God has a plan, has a purpose. And by faith, we have to fulfill that purpose. That's how Abraham walked. Same thing with Joshua and so on. So, so do we understand this, that, um, that God... Yeah, so this is where faith comes, and do we understand the importance of faith now? Right? So God is sovereign, God is a God of grace, and this is where faith comes. Right? Now, what I want to also present to us here is, and we see this in the ministry of Jesus, that when there is no faith, when there is unbelief, God will not force a miracle. I mean, he can if he wants to, as a sovereign God. But normally, normally he will not force. Because he wants us all to receive by faith. So you see in the ministry of Jesus in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 57 and 58, that when Jesus came to his own town, hometown of Nazareth. So Nazareth was a town where Jesus grew up. And Jesus came to his own hometown. It says here, in verse 58 of Matthew 13, He could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. In his own hometown, he couldn't do many mighty works. Because of their they didn't believe. They said, hey, this is carpenter. He made the desk I'm sitting on, my chair I'm sitting on, he only made. How he can do a miracle? See, that's their thinking. He's a carpenter. He made those desks and chairs and all that. How is he going to do any mighty work? So they didn't believe. Same thing in Mark 6, you know. Mark records this. It says, uh, he could, in verse 5, Mark 6, verse 5, he could do no mighty work there. Uh, he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. So just a few sick people were healed. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He couldn't do many mighty works. He was wondering, oh, these people, full of unbelief. They couldn't believe. So they struggled. So now, let's think about this. 
was Jesus as anointed by the Holy Spirit in Nazareth as he was in other cities? He had the same Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit was, an, was upon him. Did Jesus have the same authority? Yeah. So the problem was not with Jesus. He's still the same Jesus. But yet he could not do many mighty works in Nazareth. Why? Because the problem was not with Jesus. It was because of their unbelief. People didn't believe. So nothing mighty happened. No mighty miracles. Yeah. So we see here, even in, uh, you know, um, in, the, in the ministry of Jesus, that he required people to come by faith. Right? So while God will do things sovereignly by grace, the norm is he requires us to receive by faith what he freely offers us through grace. So try to understand the dynamic of God's sovereign sovereignty, of grace and faith. God can work sovereignly, but he wants us to come and receive by faith. That's the norm. Okay. Now, some things to consider here that God in his wisdom has deemed it fit for both these to coexist. That means he is sovereign and he is gracious. They exist. And he wants us to operate by faith. He, he, he won't, he's, he's, he's kept all this together. Right? He decided it's going to be like this. Okay? It's not you and I made it up, but God decided that this is how he wants to work. And there are certain things that depend solely on the sovereignty of God. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ will return. That is the work of God. Whether you have you and I have faith for it or not, doesn't matter. Jesus will come. You say Jesus is not coming, Jesus is not coming, he'll come. Hello, how are you? <laughs> he will come. He said he's coming back. He will set up his kingdom. Whether you and I believe it or not, he's going to set up his kingdom on earth. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. So that is God will do his work because he's sovereign. Nobody can stop it as part of his eternal purpose. So whether we exercise faith for that or not, he will do it. And in extending all his gifts freely to us out of grace, God is being equal and fair to all of us. See? He's actually being impartial. When he says, look, I'm giving salvation, healing, provision, deliverance. I'm giving it to everybody freely by grace. I just want you to come and receive by faith. Everybody has to receive by faith. So what's, what's God doing? He's saying, I'm making it equal, level ground. No partiality. Everybody comes and receives by faith. It doesn't matter if you're a rich man or a poor man, educated or uneducated, uh, it doesn't matter which, which country you live in, whatever. Everybody has to come and receive by faith. So equal. It's equal for everybody. Not, no, no difference. So when God is telling us to come by faith, He's actually being very fair. He's actually being equal to every person. Okay. So... So in Romans 4 and verse 16, Paul says, you know, he says, it is of faith so that it might be by grace so that the promise will be sure to all the seed. It means there is faith, there is grace, so that the promise is equally available to every person. Romans 4, 16. So the promise was based on faith. In the Good News Bible, Romans 4, 16. So the promise was based on faith in order that the promise should be guaranteed as God's free gift to all. So because he wants to make, make it available to everybody, he says, just, 
you know, I'm giving it by grace. All I want is everybody must come by faith. Right? So he's made it equal to every person. Then, uh, just two more thoughts here. The realm of faith has its perimeters set by the will and purpose of God. We cannot, by faith, change God's sovereign will. Okay? So the boundaries of faith is set by the will of God. I can't change the will of God by faith in, in normal things. You know, I can't do that. For example, like we said, God has willed that Jesus Christ will return. He's already said that in the Bible. Now, I can't use my faith and say, Jesus, stay in heaven, don't come. I can't do that. I can't use my faith to say, Jesus will not return. No, 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 no. He will return. Whether you use your faith or not, he is going to return. He'll come. So I can't override God's sovereign plan by faith. Faith has its boundaries. And lastly, there is a realm of mystery. Why? Because God will sovereignly accept his grace and uh, mercy, independent of a person having faith. You know, sometimes this happens even in our, you know, in some settings. Example, a Sunday service, somebody comes to church, they don't know A, B, C of who Jesus is. They don't know. They come, they sit on their service, and we are praying, and God heals that person. The person says, I came with this problem. I got healed. Do you know who Jesus is? No, I don't know who Jesus is. Then we are wondering, how did this person get healed? Does it know anything about Jesus? Does it know ABC of the Bible? Nothing. But this person got healed. How? Well, because God is sovereign. He will do it if he wants to do it. He'll just move. Right? So while we understand the importance of faith and grace and faith, we also understand there is a realm of mystery where God will sovereignly extend his grace and mercy. Even when a person doesn't have faith, he will touch that person. That is God moving as a sovereign God. Are you understanding this? Okay. So the reason I put this as chapter 2 is because uh, this is an area where many people get confused. They don't understand. But if we are very clear in our minds that God is sovereign, He is God of grace, and in His grace He gives us everything freely, but He wants all of us to come and receive by Everything God gives freely by grace, I must receive by faith. And if God, in His sovereignty, decides to do something special, oh, that's up to Him. It's okay. But I still must come and receive by faith everything He gives by grace. Okay. Let me just quickly see if uh, there are any questions on the online students. Um, any questions here? Oh, a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's look at the questions here from the online students. Uh, Nina, the virtues that we need to make every effort to add to our faith, do these get added on as we mature in Him, or do we make a conscious effort? Okay. So Nina is asking uh, the question uh, in relation to our previous chapter. Uh, Second Peter chapter one, verse uh, seven through seven onwards, where Paul said, "You know, add to your faith those seven ingredients." So the question Nina is asking is, uh, does it happen automatically as we grow, or do we consciously add to it? So based on the rest of Scripture, we can say that we have to consciously grow in those things. You know, we have to be conscious about growing in knowledge, about growing in kindness about growing in love and endurance. So these are things that we, we, we work with the help of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God and through our fellowship with other believers. We grow in these things. So that would be the answer. You know, we, we, with the help of God and 
his word and along with other people, we grow in all of these. Um, another question here uh, from Nina. When we pray for those who are sick of other faith, can we depend on his promises on or off healing or the or will the sovereignty of God be in operation? Now, there is no one set answer. Uh, it really depends on the individual. If the individual is open to hearing the gospel, what we would do is we would share the gospel because the gospel is the word of faith. It, it will build faith in their hearts. We tell them about Jesus, who's healer, who's deliverer, who's a miracle worker. And then in that context, it is their faith in the message preached uh, through which they will receive healing or miracle. And that's based, I'm, I'm basing what I'm saying on Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, because Paul says, you know, we, the word of faith which we preach, it produces faith. Right? So that's the norm. That's why we, go, we have to go and preach the gospel to people, even the unsaved. We preach the gospel. They hear about Jesus. They believe in Jesus Christ. And in response to their faith, they experience salvation and healing and miracles and deliverance. That's the normal. But there will also be this, we also have to accommodate or be open to the fact that there will be times when God will move sovereignly. So suppose somebody comes who's never heard about Jesus and you have only one minute to pray. Maybe you're, you're on your way and you don't have time to explain the gospel. What do you do? Still pray. Because God can move sovereignly independent of faith. Right? So we have room for that as well. Right? But if you have the opportunity, of course, our responsibility is to preach the gospel, is to explain the gospel to them and encourage their faith and then pray. But if you don't have time, you don't have the opportunity, we still pray because God can move sovereignly independent of faith and uh, bring a healing or a miracle in their lives. So we are open to both ways. But the norm is we have to preach the gospel and then for them to believe and then the miracle work happens. Krisha has a question. If we have a dream for a specific direction, and we have a feeling it's from God. Should we have faith it's from God? How to discern? Yeah, Krishna. So one is, of course, we need to uh, test and see if it is from God. So the Bible tells us, Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter, second verse. It says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So if you have a dream, uh, you pray and say, God, I want you to confirm it. So sometimes it may come as the dream itself may be a confirmation of something God has been speaking, or sometimes there will be other confirmations that come. So you, you and I need to be, you know, we need to receive confirmation that this is what God is speaking to you. Uh, very important is you listen to the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and 16. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. So there is an inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Okay, So you have a dream. Holy Spirit is bearing witness. This is from God. There is the peace of God in your heart. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart. Right. So God's peace is in your heart. So you've got the confirmation. Then what we need to do is then we need to step out and work it out by faith. Just like Abraham, which we read in Hebrews chapter 11, 8 onwards. You know, Abraham was called by God to go out. And it says here, by faith, Abraham obeyed God. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So he had a word from God, but he still had to obey by faith. Right? And that's the same with us also. We, God speaks to us, maybe in a dream, a prophecy, through his scriptures, however, but we need to obey by faith. Okay? I hope that helps. Krisha. Okay. Any other questions? Questions from here? Yes. Go ahead. You can sit on and ask. Sit down. Just, say, just speak loudly so I can hear you. Go ahead.
Okay, I understand your question. Please sit down. So the question is, uh, we said that faith cannot override, it cannot change God's sovereign will. So if a person we pray for doesn't, does not get healed, uh, does it mean that uh, it was God's will for him not to get healed? Okay, so that's the question. So to answer that question, we must first ask another question, which is, what is God's will concerning healing? And we know from the Bible that it is God's will to heal every person of every sickness. How do we know that? Many scriptures. Psalm 103, verse 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. It's very clear. God heals all our diseases. And Psalm 103 is for everybody. It's not just for few people. Now, every, anybody can read Psalm 103. It's for them. So God heals us of all our diseases. And like this. So another, another way we can say it is, whatever Jesus did on the cross, he did it for everybody. What Jesus did on the cross, he did it for everybody. He bore all our sins on the cross. That's why we can tell any sinner, it is God's will for you to be forgiven, for, for you to be saved. Why? Because Jesus bore the sins of the whole world. You all with me? So when a, when a person comes and says, I want Jesus to forgive my sin. We never say, I will pray and I will ask God whether it is will to forgive you your sin or to come to heaven or go to hell. No, we know instantly. Because Jesus died for the sins of the whole. What Jesus did on the cross, he did it for everybody. So what else did Jesus do on the cross? On the cross. He bore our sicknesses and our diseases so that we could be healed. So even that work of carrying our sickness and our disease so that by his stripes we could be healed is for everybody. Correct. Because he did it on the cross. Whatever he did on the cross, he did it for everybody. So, when a sick person comes, we say, hey, just look to the cross. The same cross on which he bore your sins, he also bore your sicknesses and diseases. That's what we can say. So, so the, the answer to that question is, it is God's will to heal anyone of any condition, any disease. Another reason we can say is, look at the ministry of Jesus. In the ministry of Jesus, now Jesus is the perfect expression of the Father. If you want to know the will of God, look at Jesus. He is the Word who became flesh. So this is the Word of God in, in action. This is the will of God in action. In the ministry of Jesus, not even once did he tell a sick person, Oh, for you, it is the Father's will for you to remain sick. God wants to make you very spiritual. God wants to teach you a spiritual lesson. Not one person he spoke like that. Not one person. In fact, the Bible says, all who came, he healed. So that's the will of God. Right? So like this, we can look at scripture. We can prove that it is God's will for any sick person to be healed from any disease. So, having knowing the will of God, we can pray with faith, expecting that person to be healed. So when you pray for a sick person, you never pray, if it be thy will. 
please heal this person. Never pray like that. Why? Because God said, I already told you my will. Why are you saying, if it be my will? So we never pray like that. Oh Lord, if it be your will, heal him. Else take him to heaven. <laughs> we never pray like that. That is the wrong way to pray. Why? Because we already know the will of God. Jesus never prayed for a sick person that way. There was only one person, the leper. He came to Jesus. He said, Lord, if it be your will, heal me. Jesus' response is, I will be healed. See? Matthew 15, 26, yeah. So it is not good to take the children's bread and throw the dogs, yeah. So Matthew 15, so when Jesus came in his earthly ministry, right, his first priority was to minister to the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. So that's why even in Matthew 10, when he sent his disciples, he said, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That means right now, God's plan was minister to Israel. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, then the gospel was to be preached to all the nations. You understand? It? So that's why at that time, Jesus told this woman, I can't take what I'm supposed to give to the children, meaning Israel, and give it outside. I can't do that. But what happened? Her faith jumped the fence. Right? She said, but God, just give me crumb from the table enough. So even at that time, even though God's plan was only for the nation of Israel at that time, she was still able to receive by faith. You know, so faith overrode at that, in that particular case, right? Uh, uh, because by faith she received. Although that, that at that time God's plan was for Israel. Okay. So it's like an exception, you know, God 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 did that for her. Okay. Let me just answer one question in the chat. Surya, will faith alone can say from anything and from everything? So Surya, uh, 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 let me just answer that question like this, you know. The word salvation, the word salvation in the Bible, in the New Testament, is the word sozo, sozo. And I think you will be studying about it in lifestyle evangelism class as well. Uh, salvation, the word salvation in the Greek is sozo, and it's a comprehensive word. That means when the Bible says saved or salvation, it includes forgiveness of sins, healing from sickness, deliverance from demonic power, victory over evil, over sickness, whatever, the, the works of darkness. So salvation is comprehensive. It simply means that God is taking us out of everything Adam put us under. So by grace you are saved, so so. By grace, you have sowed so through faith. So the answer is yes. Everything God is giving as that package of salvation, we receive by faith. That's why we can say, you know, forgiveness of sins, healing for your body, victory over sin, victory over demonic powers, deliverance, safety, preservation, wholeness spiritual, emotional, and physical healing. It's all included in that word sozo. So everything that God is giving as salvation, we receive by grace through faith. Okay, I hope that answers your question. If, if it's not clear, uh, please let me know, Surya. Okay, any questions here? Yes, charisma? Please, uh, Okay.
Um, say that again. If a person has faith, I said. Oh, is that predestined by God? No. I'll give you a verse. Please sit down. Uh, Matthew chapter 15. Oh, the same passage he referred to. Uh, verse 28. This woman comes to Jesus. And uh, Jesus says, O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you as you will. We'll study it in, 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 in the coming chapter. So her, her will was involved. Her will was involved. Not the predestination of God or the predestination. No, no. It was her will. She decided to go to Jesus. She decided to have faith. O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you even as you will. Another reference, John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You ask what you will, and it will be done for you. So faith involves our will. We'll study about that. Okay? So time is up. Uh, time is up already. So thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll pause here. We'll continue this next week. Okay? Please take your break. I would like to pray, but time has already gone, so uh, I don't want to uh, delay the next class. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining online. See you again next week. God bless.